I'm Tom Berwald. Uh, I am a former president of the Association of American Geographers, and uh, more pertinently, I am uh, one of the Geography and Spatial Sciences program directors at the National Science Foundation. And it's my pleasure uh, to be introducing to you my boss's boss, uh, Myron Gutman, who is the Assistant Director for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences at NSF. Now, Assistant Director is a, uh, a benign-sounding title here. I'd like to emphasize it's a sister, Assistant to the Director of NSF, overseeing all of the Social, Behavioral, Economic Sciences. That includes geography and spatial sciences as well. We're delighted to have Myron here. He actually gave a similar kind of presentation a year ago in Seattle, at that time talking about a visioning process, a planning process that was underway at the time. And uh, much of what he'll be talking about here shortly uh, is now coming uh, and, and sharing with you some of the outputs from that uh, activity and, and longer range thoughts toward the future of our sciences and SBE and even as it moves beyond. Myron is a historian by trade. His PhD is from Princeton University. He's held major appointments at, uh, uh, among other places, the University of Texas and the University of Michigan. At Michigan, he headed uh, the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research, a major uh, data, uh, re repository for a good deal of the, the valuable data and information that we as geographers and many other uh, folks in the social behavioral economic sciences use. Since 2009, he has been at an NSF in the role of uh, the Assistant Director for SBE. Uh, as a researcher, he has been successful in obtaining awards from a number of organizations, uh, including uh, NIH and NSF. His research interests themselves have uh, focused on topics including uh, uh, the uh, history of the U.S. Hispanic population and the relationship of population and environment in the Great Plains. And having seen uh, his, some of his presentations on the latter topic, I can assure you that he may be a historian by uh, by background and reputation, but there's a good deal of geographic blood that flows through his veins. So please join me in welcoming Myron Gutman, who will talk about uh, questions without borders, why future research will be interdisciplinary, and how we can foster it. Please. Tom, thanks very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here again with the AAG. It's one of my annual uh, satisfactions to come to this meeting to hear sessions and to talk about, there we go, much better. I can usually be heard in a room this size anyway, as you know. Uh, I'm here to you today to talk about ways that we can advance knowledge in the social, behavioral, and economic sciences by taking advantage of insights and achievements beyond our conventional disciplinary borders. Although many at AAG work outside the university environment, a lot of what I'm gonna have to say is really focused on our colleagues in the universities, because I think that's the area where so much change has taken place, but also where so much change still needs to occur. I care about this topic for two reasons. First, I believe that some of the most promising research lies at the intersection of traditional disciplines, and that these investigations respond to problems that drive our fields and confront us on a global scale. Without, research, without the ability to open our minds to these opportunities and to teach our students how to make use of them, we're not going to be able adequately to advance science. Second, I've seen in my own career how rich investigations at the boundaries can be. As Tom said, I was trained as a historian and demographer, but I've worked in many areas, most recently in spatial science, ecology, and the science of data. Lately, I've been writing about the ways that population change and agricultural development have shaped the environment, specifically by producing greenhouse gases through agriculture. Understanding anthropogenic contributions to global climate change is critical and requires more than a single disciplinary approach. Crossing over from domain to domain has allowed me to contribute much more than I would have had I stayed within one of the traditional disciplines. But caring isn't sufficient. We simply aren't doing enough to broaden our approaches to science. It's something I hope to change, and frankly, in my current position at NSF, I think that I can catalyze that change. Finally, fair warning, 
I have no crisp answers, no quick fixes, no recipes for success. Rather, I'll share with you some observations and invite you to help me think through the issues and future directions. Scholarship changes. We no longer study the trivium or the quadrivium in universities. We don't have chairs in departments of natural philosophy either. My choice of the image of a mosaic was calculated. As many of you know, we launched a visioning process in August 2010. I spoke about it at your meeting in Seattle last April. And we called that process SBE 2020, trying to look at least a decade out, which is a long way for science agencies these days. It resulted in a report that we released last November called Rebuilding the Mosaic. And we tried to do two things. We wanted the research community to tell us where they believed research was going over the next decade and longer. And we wanted to understand the programmatic implications of that vision of research for our directorate. We received 252 white papers. They're individually fascinating, highly varied, broad and focused, diverse in their topics. They also possess an underlying coherence. In many ways, most of the papers propose a model for future research that's collaborative, multidisciplinary, highly data intensive. Here are some examples. Developmental psychology, cognitive psychology, and neuroscience combine psychology, computer science, biology, and physiology to address fundamental questions in consciousness, perception, cognition, and learning. The contributions of behavioral economics, which draw on the psychological sciences and economics both, are well known. The economists have also called attention for us to contributions from anthropology, sociology, and demography. As you are well aware as anyone, the spatial sciences and geographic frameworks for analysis are deeply now embedded across many disciplines. And finally, papers about environmental and climate change point to the importance of integrating data and synthesizing results across archaeology, anthropology, sociology, politics, technological change, ecology, and the natural sciences. Papers about urbanization, aging, and migration make similar connections. These topics speak simultaneously to fundamental problems in the SBE sciences and to challenges we face locally, nationally, and globally. Consider just one pragmatic example, obesity in public health. Achieving and maintaining good health requires both individual and societal perspectives. It's a multidimensional, multi-layered topic that integrates an understanding of human biology and physiology with the economics of healthcare and access to services and facilities, such as libraries and community recreation centers. It also requires that you understand the interaction and dependencies among social networks, educational achievement, how decisions are made, how people re receive and absorb explicit and implicit messages about safety, health, activity, and appearance, and the availability of food, medicine, and help at some combination of the corner store, the pharmacy, and the clinic. In that last long sentence, I mentioned interlaced topics in psychology, communication, decision-making, economics, sociology and anthropology, political science, urban studies, and the spatial sciences. I probably left some out. They're all part of the research that our directorate at NSF supports. So clearly this and similar challenges, sustaining adequate levels of public health or population change, global climate change, urban planning, hazard response and mitigation, all these motivate a vision of multidisciplinary data intensive research. There's also a sense that advances in computational 
and data infrastructure render such integrative problems newly tractable. Jointly, the combination lets us delve afresh into the questions that motivate our sciences. Despite decades of enthusiasm for interdisciplinary research and some clear success stories in neuroscience, biochemistry, material science, and bioinformatics, not to mention fields like demography and the spatial sciences and geography, where I feel so much at home, we know surprisingly little about the extent of interdisciplinary work. Moreover, discussions of the extent of interdisciplinarity bogged down in definitional and organizational barriers. To what departments are students and faculty assigned? How is overhead and other credit allocated? Because interdisciplinarity frequently seems to assume collaboration, how are attribution and credit assigned? How can an evaluation committee be assembled with the requisite expertise? And against what set of values is the combined research measured? One of our first observations in the 2020 white papers was that the diversity and backgrounds and affiliations of the contributing authors. A surprising number of them reported affiliations with more than one department and with research centers and institutes. Although the sample is small and not scientific, it provides evidence that researchers' interests and self-perceptions didn't necessarily align well with organizational structures based on traditional disciplines. There exists an implicit model of the relationship between scientific research and the organization of that research that goes something like this. Individuals work in disciplinary departments, they progress through their careers by demonstrating expertise and making contributions to knowledge through juried publications. The traditional departmental organization of universities and scholarly communication can succeed, especially when intellectual content aligns neatly with disciplines, so that credentialing systems appropriately confer prestige, promotion, and career advancement. But that doesn't always happen. The trifecta of prestige, promotion, and career advancement is challenged when two or more people share authorship, even if both are nominally in the same discipline, and it can break down completely when the organization of disciplines no longer reflects the underlying content of ideas. This characterization is more simplistic, extreme, and dire, of course, than is actually the case especially to an audience of geographers whose interests, expertise, and publications span many intellectual traditions. But I put it this way so that we can see some of the assumptions and relationships that matter to me. Most importantly, fields of study aren't static, and new departments and subfields are formed as science changes. Material science remote to some of what we do, but important to the fundamental electronics that animates so much of what's going on in this room, is a well-known contemporary example of the creation of a new field. I don't have much time to say, to say much about material science, except that it came into existence under explicit federal stewardship after 1960. Federal grants funded research centers, which were organizational units inside the university, but intentionally separate from departments, designed to facilitate collaboration among physicists, chemists, and engineers. Between 1964 and 1985, the number of academic departments in U.S. universities with the title, title materials, or the word materials in their title, increased fivefold. And by the 1970s, there was substantial evidence that the standard curriculum in engineering and the physical sciences had become more interdisciplinary. So the structure of the universities, as well as the content of the science, had begun to change. To contemporary eyes, however, there was little evidence that co-location in interdisciplinary centers had produced substantial intellectual integration. Their evidence, 
a limited number of joint publications by researchers. Stripped to its essentials, this thumbnail sketch of the intellectual history of material science exposes some key features. First, a shared intellectual problem. Next, an agency with resources such as DARPA or NSF needs to take leadership and make funds available to spur actions. Third, institutions must create separate organizational units, in this case a center, in which to enable researchers in different fields to work together on aspects of the problem. Not surprisingly, new fields of study coalesce with differing degrees of intellectual integration. Hence the effort to distinguish between multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and cross-disciplinary research, a distinction that I find extremely hard to make. The need to measure the impact of investments in research that crosses disciplinary boundaries leads to fascinating challenges in measurement. On the one hand, material science has had a record of undeniable discoveries and advances almost from the start. Clearly, it advanced and changed the way that a set of scientific fields developed. It did so both by informing disciplinary curricula and by creating a new department or field of study. But the measure of intellectual integration that seemed most meaningful for some observers was the publication record. That record may have been slower to change than even the universities themselves. New curricula, new organizational units preceded the collaborative publications that everyone expected. Academic majors are another way to measure the penetration of interdisciplinary study. By that measure, the numbers are comparatively small. Fewer than 2.5% of bachelor's degrees awarded in 2008-2009 were in multi- or interdisciplinary studies. The percentage decreases as students progress through their graduate studies, constituting less than 1% of master's degrees and less than 2% of doctorates in 2008-2009. On the other hand, 25 to 30 percent of recipients of doctoral degrees reported primary and secondary fields of study between 2001 and 2008 in the annual survey of earned doctorates, providing a rough measure of the interdisciplinary content of dissertations, if not of departmental affiliations. Again, the science clearly precedes the organization. Graduate students in particular are intellectually omnivorous. They go where their ideas take them and want to use the best tools to answer their questions. Diana Roten and Andrew Parker made this point in 2004 when they found that despite the barriers, graduate students and full professors were more likely than mid-career scholars to undertake interdisciplinary research. Graduate students at the University of Texas at San Antonio told us that they came to the social and behavioral sciences by way of concrete life experiences related to issues like housing and migration. Roten and Parker found similar interest among students in pursuing core problems of society, even if that curiosity took them to the fringe of science. Our white paper authors as well urged NSF to support problem-oriented multidisciplinary research to address global challenges. If we take a step back and look at the landscape, these separate voices all tell us that we are trying to measure several moving targets, the content of the science, the ability of departments to accommodate changing content, and the curiosity of both graduate students and their advisors. But is a reward structure based on, inter on disciplinary values really the proper way to train our students for a world whose challenges are complex and speak powerfully to their intellect and imaginations? Why are most of our programs of study anchored in disciplinary departments? What messages are universities sending when that's the way that students are recruited and begin their careers? Our directorate, the Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences Directorate at NSF, maintains programs in a broad range of scientific fields that study organizational change related to science. 
In Stephen Carr's classic study of displaced incentives, he raises the issue that many of us understand. Universities claim to value teaching, but they reward research productivity. The analog for my topic today is the notion that we talk about interdisciplinarity, but reward other behaviors, such as publication in journals with the highest impact factor. Then we leave critical decision making about admissions and advancement of students and promotion and tenure of faculty in the hands of disciplinary departments. At the National Science Foundation, we hear similar criticisms. And I remain concerned about a widespread perception that we are too rigid based on comments from potential investigators who look at the configuration of programs at NSF and wonder how their interests might fit in. So let me reassure you, NSF's program officers work hard to ensure that proposals receive a fair hearing. But most of them are tied to programs aligned with traditional disciplines. And I say that even when they're not in the front row of the audience. Inevitably, as one of them told me, proposals that require multiple levels of analysis to answer complex and comprehensive questions about behavior are the most challenging to fund from a single program. This is as much a matter of budgetary constraints as it is a matter of reviewers, panelists, and program officers being justifiably proprietary about scarce resources. There's also the matter of proposals like this sometimes requiring additional or different expertise for review. We actually do better than this thoughtful comment might imply. Leah Nichols, a AAAS science and technology fellow who's working in our office, is undertaking an in-depth analysis of our portfolio for the last decade using advanced text mining techniques developed by our Science of Science and Innovation Policy Program. Her early findings suggest that we do a better job than we thought at accommodating the omnivorous interests of our scientists. Many of the awards we make cross disciplinary boundaries. Whether measured by budget expended, units involved within NSF, or the text of the proposals themselves, SBE devotes considerable resources to interdisciplinary projects, especially those related to the environment, to decision making, to nanotechnology, and to the science of learning. These topics are broad and important, extending well beyond the SBE sciences themselves, but I admit that they don't comp comprise the entirety of what we might do. I said earlier that the critical steps in bringing about more interdisciplinary science come from scientists identifying the questions, from agencies providing leadership, and from scientific institutions undertaking change. NSF, for its part, is trying to display leadership. New organizations are emerging with universities to encourage collaboration by students and faculty. What about the science questions? In the Mosaic Report, we describe four promising cross-cutting topics. Population change, social health and other disparities, communications and language, and new technology. These topics offer rich opportunities for cross-cutting research because they span so much of what we do in SBE and link so well to other programs at NSF. Population change, for example, leads us to think about aging, migration, and family change, all critical for our society's future. Demographic research is deeply embedded in economics and sociology, of course. But a thorough understanding of population change takes us to geography and spatial science, to the psychological sciences, to linguistics, among other programs in SBE, and then to studies of geoscience and atmospheric science for understanding coastal populations and well beyond. And that doesn't even start down the path towards understanding the relationship between population change and political change. These topics arose out of the white papers, but we can imagine others, for example, a trajectory around the notion of civic and political participation. Political participation is central to a healthy democracy. Since Tocqueville, civic engagement has been a feature of the American experiment in democratic government. 
Now more than 200 years into the experiment, participation in the U.S. electorate has fallen to worrisome lows, worthy of continuing study. We're beginning to learn a lot about how people make these choices. They draw from a mix of genetics, experience, access to information, social networks, and family history, along with rhetoric and the media to understand political participation and change. So we already have a program called Decision Risk and Management Science, but it's clear that we need to expand our scope. While we may not need a program that's called Participation Science for Political Life, we need to understand the need to move in directions of that sort. The challenge is greater when we think, when we are then thinking about one new program or another, however. There are a wealth of scientific opportunities out there which have the potential to draw on insights from inside and outside the traditional SBE sciences. As economics has learned from psychology over the past 20 years, so we expect to learn from genetics and computer science and from new combinations of data. So I'm ending with questions and invitations. First, I might be wrong. Perhaps the enthusiasm for interdisciplinary approaches overshadows the case for the disciplinary sciences. It should be clear to you that from my perspective, there's little reason to choose between approaches that are curiosity-driven and disciplinary and those that are problem-driven and not disciplinary. It all has value. But if I'm wrong, push back. Tell me where the advances are in the disciplinary sciences and how those approaches will answer fundamental questions. Second, tell me how we can work together to affect change. Tell me how we can be sure that students have the breadth of training they need to overcome disciplinary boundaries, how to make it safe for young faculty to pursue the interests that initially propelled them into research careers, and how to enable mid-career and senior faculty to change course as opportunities arise. How should NSF nurture that passion and allow it to advance knowledge? NSF is prepared to put funding on the table. As many of you have seen, NSF has issued a dear colleague letter about a program called Creative Research Awards for Transformative Interdisciplinary Ventures, creative without an E for short. These awards target, I think I'm, yeah, there's, these awards target innovative, high risk and high reward interdisciplinary proposals that can be up to five years duration and are open to all NSF supported areas of science, engineering, and education research. In addition to that, we in SBE have reissued our dear colleague letter that encourages investigators to submit proposals in interdisciplinary research that might not fit entirely or easily within current programmatic structures. Looking beyond this fiscal year, we're beginning to develop what I hope will be a multi-year solicitation for a new program in interdisciplinary research in the SBE sciences. We would like that call to appear in the spring of 2012 with awards to be made next fall or winter. We have also just announced an opportunity for communities to coalesce around new interdisciplinary approaches to data across diverse fields in the SBE sciences and those related to education. NSF can do a lot through funding mechanisms, but if we do our part, can those in the university do theirs? Can they make it ease, safe for adventuresome faculty to publish results and grow in their careers? What will it take for that to occur? That's the big question. What metrics, in addition to publications, would we, should we consider during hiring, promotion, and tenure that will enable intellectual omnivores of any age to demonstrate their contributions to new frontiers of knowledge? Those are big questions. They link the university environment and the funding environment, and they require joint action to get there. So the main question in the end becomes, what can we be doing beyond putting financial resources out there and constructing programs that integrate the sciences to make it work together? And how should we do that? Thank you. <laughs>